I'm from Chicago. I'm also a little bit on the faculty at, uh, at LSU. I think I may be the only periodontist, perhaps in the country, on an oral surgery faculty. And um, uh, Dan is at, exclusively at LSU. And we're here to really talk to you about change in progress. That's really the, the core, the scope of what we're going to be talking about. And I love these two quotes to begin the lecture. The first is that progress is impossible without change. And that those who can't change their minds simply can't change anything. And of course, change being the law of life. Those who only look to the past or present are sure to miss the future, and that was John Kennedy. So with that, we're going to uh, direct your attention today. Uh, we're going to look at a few different uh, aspects. We're going to try to really go through this presentation quickly to give you a, a lot of information and hope you'll uh, enjoy it. Um, this is a patient that actually came to our practice uh, several years ago, and you know the, the issue was referring this patient for the dental implant at number 10. Well, with the ability of imaging, the ability to really look at the patient on a much more craniomandibular global scope, the question isn't so much, does this patient have bone to put an implant in? What's the aesthetics outcome going to be? Is this a good implant candidate? The real question here is, is that skeletal and regional anatomy correct for the given tooth position? You know, you, you, we used to basically try to morph the teeth based on dental malocclusions. And today, what Dan and I are going to show you is how we're morphing the most plastic structure uh, of the human anatomy, the dental alveolar bone, and allowing the teeth to move into it. So CBCT is an interdisciplinary diagnostic and treatment planning tool. Let's look at, real quickly at the state of the art in incorporating today's technology and how we can facilitate the delivery of care. A patient who presents with a deciduous cuspid, uh, most of us have seen this in practice today, you know, and the traditional approach would be imaging, uh, maybe extract the tooth, the diagnostic wax up, um, traditional surgery, platform level impressions, and a drawn out type of treatment approach. Obviously even a periodontist can take that tooth out. <laughs> Looking at this case, there's no question that if this is going to be a screw access restoration, why well, need to graft bone on the facial aspect in order to change the implant angulation. But today, we're going to basically try to place the implant in the right um, dental alveolar bone position. We're going to correct the angle discrepancy through a CAD CAM patient-specific abutment, um, an Atlantis abutment, do this virtually. Everything is going to be worked up virtually. The model is optically scanned. A virtual tooth is imposed, and you can see the angle correction. The Atlantis abutment is made on the computer. The CAD CAM provisional is also made. And so what I think is amazing about this is you have a guide in the center there that's being made in Belgium. You had an abutment and a provisional, which I just showed you, all being made before the surgery. The guide's being made in Belgium, the abutment's being made in Boston, and the, and the uh, provisional is being made in, uh, in the lab in Arizona. And all those things are going to come together at the time of the surgery. So here we are extracting the tooth, the guide's going to go into place, the implant is positioned, very high uh, Ostel reading. The uh, Atlantis abutment drops right into place, non-occlusal function provisional place to maintain the soft tissue position. You can see the bradygraph there with the implant. And here's a 14-week follow-up. From, uh, uh, from a soft tissue standpoint, the soft tissue looks fantastic. And when we take the provisional off, we can appreciate the sulcular health uh, from both the buccal and the palatal aspect. And we're going to transition now, and we're going to go ahead and go to the final restoration. But the question is really, you know, have we reached a point where all this digital technology is going to come together and save us time? Would we have been better off doing the um, provisional as a screw retain, creating our soft tissue form, taking a platform level impression, and making a final restoration? In this particular situation, while everything looked good at 14 weeks, when the restorative dentist went ahead and modified the provisional, you can see on the mesial aspect there, there's a slight change in the soft tissue profile. And so the question is, is the uh, uh, CAD CAM generated abutment uh, sufficient enough to maintain the soft tissue profiles? Am I good enough to, um, uh, to predict exactly the soft tissue changes that are going to happen so that that abutment does not ever have to come off again? The so-called one abutment, one time concept, and this is what we're trying to accomplish today. Well, with the technology, we're able to basically modify those abutments uh, in a lab, change the contours. Uh, through a computer, have a new abutment made, change that abutment only once, so we're only disrupting that, that interface once, and then take it to a final completion. Now, for those of you who are really astute, from a Fernhauser pink aesthetic score, I probably really didn't hit the mark here. I mean, we still have some issues in terms of the interdental papilla. 
So um, the question remains, would we have been better off going to a, a, um, a standard approach or was this sufficient for the patient? But this is certainly where the technology is taking us today. And then the final abutment. Today we have cases like this where you kind of take models and you wonder what am I supposed to do with the case like this? It maybe sits on your desk for quite a while. Well, maybe I'll take a CT scan. And that's kind of where, where it sits for a while. Maybe this is stored on your computer. With today's technology, being able to do a trial tooth setup, a virtual denture setup, and interface this onto the CT scan, we can now go ahead and, and do all this on one CT scan to know exactly where the teeth used to be, where the new tooth position is going to be from a function and aesthetic standpoint, and where our implants are going to go for immediate load surgery. And through a team approach, oral surgery, periodontics, restorative dentistry, prosthetics, we can transform people's lives. And this is really exciting about how imaging is allowing us and taking us to this next level. And before and after anatomy reconstructions, you can see on the left, this is a, um, uh, these are pre-surgical scans um, prior to reconstructive surgery, and these are post-surgical um, outcomes, and this is oftentimes what we look at, and maybe we say, hey, this is a great result. The reality is this is a radiograph. This is not biology. We need to make sure that we're doing due diligence, validating what we're achieving from a surgical standpoint. And so uh, it's nice to see we've got bleeding blown, uh, bleeding bone and we seem to have good regenerative outcomes for many of these cases, really it's the, it's the histology. So how many of us are really stewards of our profession? And I think that's an underscore that we need to make today is we all need to be stewards of the profession making sure that we're really achieving the outcomes from a biologic standpoint. You know, the technology will come and go, but this is what remains um, uh, at our core principle as professionals. Even trauma cases, a patient like this who comes in who does a, uh, uh, flips over her, her uh, uh, bicycle and uh, knocks out her front teeth, this was a patient who was all set to have all of her anterior teeth extracted and to have implants placed. And I guarantee you no implant solution is going to have the soft tissue profile capable of what natural teeth um, can, can afford us. Imaging today certainly gives us the opportunity to see what's the depths of the, um, of the fractures, how extent are the, what's the extent of the defects here, what's the prognosis going to be associated with these uh, situations. But with orthodontics, with a team approach, um, uh, we can basically take these situations, maintain natural dentitions, make good treatment decisions for the long-term health of the patient. Again, there's no implant solution here that can create the kind of health and aesthetics uh, that you see here as a final outcome. And here's her final teeth. So from going from a situation where advanced trauma, hey, let's just take all the teeth out, let's put in implants, very simple, you know, coming back, thinking about the biology, thinking about getting the uh, detailed diagnostic information of, which af uh, is afforded to us through, radio through CBCT imaging, making good treatment decisions as a team is key for the, uh, the long-term uh, health of the patient, what's in their best interest. In terms of periodontal anatomy, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I have a chance to serve as a, a board examiner for the American Board of Perio, and this, this paper comes up unequivocally. So if you're a Perio resident out there, you are getting this question and, uh, asked of you at the boards. It is Hardikoff. It is, the, what is the significance of, of the furcation area? And I find it ridiculous because the reality is the sensitivity of this marker is 42%. That means that most of the time when that's there, it's present, but when, it's, when you do have a class two furcation involvement, many times you're not going to have this marker. But yet this comes up over and over again in the literature based on traditional radiographs. Prognosis. This is an article by Mike McGuire. This is in Periodontics, how we oftentimes will look at prognosis, the things that we are uh, evaluating. And there's uh, no question that these um, uh, these portions in the red box are influenced and certainly improved when evaluated by CBCT as a diagnostic tool incorporated into our treatment armamentarium. So when we look at a patient like Jane who has significant uh, periodontal disease, she has implant needs, she has uh, site development needs and so forth, we're able to understand obviously 3 and 14 need to come out, but the question is are, are 2 and 15 suitable abutment teeth? And can I use a radiographic imaging modality to not only assess the periodontal health of, of future abutment teeth, but also develop strategies for site development and how I might go about taking care of her and sequencing her therapy with our restorative colleagues. 
There's also literature to support that the trough size, 5.3 millimeter trough size, as a panoramic reconstruction in the, in the CareStream software is comparable to intraoral radiographs. And a cross section of 0.4 millimeters is actually more accurate at detecting periodontal uh, bone loss than uh, traditional uh, x-rays. And I think one of the interesting things about imaging, Dan, and maybe you could talk a little bit about this, is the, um, you know, the ability of imaging today has expanded our concepts. In other words, we have, been, we have been conditioned to look at the front of the system for years. And that's what we do. But imaging today expands those opportunities to look at the back of the system. So when I see a patient who has facial asymmetry in a fully seated condylar position, maybe has uh, an overbite of less than a, um, a reverse overbite, or has horizontal overlap in a fully seated condylar position less than three millimeters, and maybe have moderate to severe pain of the joint, warrants imaging. We're able to not only understand the condylar surface area, the load-bearing surface area, the ramus length, the joint space, and these are actually, there are norms in the literature, but sometimes we need to go beyond that. Not only looking at the back of the system to make sure that the overall health of the patient is um, considered, but also consider MRI imaging. And on the left you have a structurally intact uh, disc complex, and on the right you have a structurally altered disc complex. Uh, Infrabony defects. From a periodontal perspective, you know, oftentimes what we're looking at are the stability of crustal lamina dura. Is the crustal lamina dura present or not present? And when we consider imaging today, both of these cases are, uh, are present. When we look at the cross section of this, sure, it looks present on one slice, but it's not, certainly there's disease activity happening here. You can see the crater interproximally. While as in the other patient, it looks quite stable, not only from a buccal perspective, but also you know, all the way uh, interproximally as well. This trough size with 300 microns and 0.09 voxel size. Um, appreciating the intrabony defects and the craters involved in these teeth, uh, looking at sinus pathology, furcations, root trunk anatomy, periodontal ligament space, and even the calculus at the distal of tooth number 18. All these intimate details can be assessed um, quite predictably. Cases before crown lengthening oftentimes are um, evaluated or managed endodontically, but sometimes MB2 is oftentimes missed. And this cross-sectional imaging shows that that uh, canal was missed uh, on the mesobuccal uh, root of tooth number 14, uh, and this patient remained with pain. So two-dimensional x-rays sometimes do not tell the full story, and further uh, imaging is uh, required for the uh, correct diagnosis of a patient. In fact, this happens to be my hygienist, who is uh, uncomfortable. She's having pain at tooth number 13. But on the periapical radiograph, you know, it doesn't look all that ominous, not all that significant. However, when you consider the cross-sectional anatomy, it's obvious that the palatal root has a periapical pathology, but it hasn't blown through the buccal cortical plate, and because that's intact, you don't appreciate it so much from a 2D perspective. Dendin vaginasis, how many endodontists would like to deal with this? It would be nice to know that ahead of time from an informed consent standpoint and to let the patient know what the difficulties might be. Orthodontics, from an, from an uncovery standpoint, you know, we've, we've been taught the slob rule, same lingual, opposite buckle, but today with imaging modalities, not only are we able to understand exactly where those cuspids is cuspids are in two cases that look relatively similar. One's facial, one case the, the cuspids are palatal, but this gives us an opportunity from an orthodontic standpoint to understand, you know, how are, how are the vectors and angle, the magnitudes of forces going to be directed? What are the biomechanics necessary for this case? And from a surgical standpoint, it gives Dan and I the opportunity to understand, well, how are we going to approach this case? How are we going to manage the bone uh, in, these, in these areas to allow the orthodontist to achieve the mechanics that are necessary? So in one case, we're going uh, facial. In the other case, we're going to do a palatal approach, removing some of the bone, putting the buttons on, and then closing the area back up allowing the orthodontist to do his thing. Implant dentistry, certainly it's changed the profession, there's no question about it, but you know, we get cases like this which are difficult. And you can see here that there's very, very poor bone density on the 2D x-ray and certainly on the, on the cross-sectional image. This is an implant that, if it's placed, it certainly may be stable because it's stable at the crest. But this is something that Dan and I would say, this is an implant hanging by its neck, more or less. And today, we can change the prognosis with some of the things that Dan is really a world expert in, in tissue engineering. We're going to extract that tooth. We're going to go ahead and trough out the, uh, the limited cortical bone that we have. And you can see it's almost like a huge crater in the, uh, um, in the body of the mandible. And we're going to change that bone quality by recombinant human BMP2 <coughs> analograft. Um, 
and improve the overall uh, bone anatomy for a future implant. So we go from something like this to something that looks like that in about seven months. And again, we're stewards of our profession, so we're going to open the area, make sure that there's good bone uh, regeneration outcome implants are placed, but at the time of implant surgery, we also want to understand what quality of bone do we have. And so we'll oftentimes take a little core biopsy out, evaluate the implants with the Ostel um, stability measurement, and understand it from a pure bone perspective. This is due diligence and our biologic validation, which we um, surmised from the CBCT imaging. It's the imaging that allowed us to create the treatment plan and give us the um, opportunity to think outside the box and what may be some treatment solutions for this patient to improve the bone quality for long-term implant health and uh, crosstalk of that implant long-term and this is what we're able to achieve. 61 percent new vital bone formation. Many of us who do root coverage procedures that have class 5 restorations on the, re on the teeth, you know, we know we want to remove those restorations. But what happens when the depth of the restorations approximates the pulp chamber? Are our patients aware that if we remove these restorations that they may be into endodontic therapy? Is that the right um, solution? Are we going to use a growth factor mediated approach for periodontal regeneration in root coverage compared to maybe a connective tissue graft that's going to give us a long junctional epithelium? Uh, are we going to use a xenograft? Are we going to use mucograft? A number of different solutions. Are we going to just do a connected uh, coronally repositioned flap? And how about using imaging for cases like this? A second opinion that comes in, a patient is in a long-term provisional in the upper arch but has significant bone deficiencies. And from a cross-sectional imaging, this was the site development that this patient underwent about a year ago. This was actually the case that Dan and I started to collaborate together on, and we uh, learned very quickly that we had a lot to gain from our relationship um, than being competitors. In fact, um, Dan and I did this case together. Uh, you can see the bone deficiency. I mean, where do you get bone for a patient like this? Unless you're Dan Spagnoli that can take bone out of the cranium or the iliac crest, there are very limited, situa limited applications, opportunities to develop bone suitable for implant placements here. But again, with uh, reconstructive opportunities with uh, tissue engineering molecules today, and you can see how thin the bone is on the upper left side, we're able to reconstruct these defects with rather advanced surgery, um, BMP2 cancellous allograft, medport contained filters, uh, and change the bone quality, change the bone dimensions so that this patient now becomes an implant uh, candidate at the age uh, of 28 years old. This is the reentry showing the outcome um, uh, post reconstruction of the maxillary right and left sides, leading to guided implant surgery, fixated in the palate, stable, and we'll go through some of these um, uh, nuances as well in a few minutes. Um, again, being stewards of the profession to make sure that we have good bone density, uh, bone healing, bone regeneration outcomes. You can see that bleeding bone. Implants are highly stable, and we have a bone density that is 76%. That's the kind of bone I want my implants in. And the imaging is certainly one opportunity to, to, um, to plan this case um, and uh, give us the outcome, uh, give us the, 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 uh, the protocol of, of doing that. In Andrew's case, we not only uh, uh, used imaging for a preoperative assessment and also a, a post-reconstruction uh, assessment to plan our implants, but we also closed the area. We put his, after the implants were placed, we put his scanning appliance right back into place, had him re-imaged, because I wanted to make sure from a collaborative accountability standpoint, a paper that Alan, my partner Alan Rosenfeld and I published on a couple years ago, collaborative accountability, the most important thing in uh, computer-guided implant treatment is that implant is right where it needs to be for the long-term health of the patient and also for the prosthetic outcome of my res restorative doctor. So you can see the initial, the post-graft, and all these slices, the reconstruction, and then the implant placement at number five. This is number six. Again, validation at number 11 and at number 12, ensuring that the prosthetically, that this case is not only done from a bone graft standpoint, but also from an implant standpoint, all with the prosthetic my the prosthetic outcome as the driving factor here. Driving factor in the bone graft, the driving factor in the implant treatment where the teeth need to be. So as a recap of our tissue engineering, we've got um, uh, the pre-op and the post-op leading to the implant placement, leading to the final outcome by Dr. Jim McKee, a wonderful dentist uh, in, in the Chicagoland area that I have an opportunity to work with. Well, George, that's just a, a great way to get us started. And first of all, I want to tell you, it's very exciting to be here, and, and I'm so happy to have a chance to, uh, to, to talk to you all today. Um, but George alluded to a couple of very important concepts. 
One of them that I think is really true is that for most of us, we're pretty much visual. In other words, if we see something, we definitely understand it better. Let me make an analogy. If I'm treating an orbital fracture, when I first trained, I might have a Waters view, a Panorex, perhaps a, a Ceph. But now, I have 3D cone beam CTs. I can measure the depths of the orbit, know where the, op where the orbital apex is, the, the opti optic nerve. So when I plan the reconstruction of that orbit, I do it correctly. You know, uh, all of these things that we do in major surgery, where we were basing them on hospital-based medical CT, now we can do in our offices. So we've brought that same imaging, the same ability to see and understand to the offices, and, and cone beam has just revolutionized things for us in so many dimensions. So, so George started some concepts. He said, let's the bone is what's plastic and moldable. Let's change the bone and adapt it to our skeletal deficiencies or create the right foundation. Um, you know, we're gonna expand upon that a little bit and look at a couple other parameters, but three things to keep in mind. We can lift up periosteum and we can do a subperiosteal bone graft of many different types, but we've got to maintain space to do it, and we've got to get the soft tissue. We can graft interpositionally, mm -hmm. jo uh, where George embellished the quality of that bone, okay? We can do that by all types of osteotomies, okay? And then we can grow bone where there is no bone. So today, uh, but imaging helps us plan it, and we need to think not only of prosthodontically driven, which is essential, but orthodontically driven. We need to really think of both of those because all in all, you know, form does follow function. And if we create the proper functional relationships in the facial skeleton and the dental skeleton, most of the time our form is gonna be pretty good and it's gonna remain healthy. So this is certainly, um, for most of us, a bit of a challenge. A set of teeth here, the, pe the patient wants to keep these teeth. She doesn't want to be edentulated and have four or five anterior implants, although that's always an option. She wants this reconstructed. But remember, we have a nerve in here, and, and every once in a while, we'll see somebody place an implant down here, but then we have an instant periodontal pocket. So we really need to place our implants at the, at the proper level. So in a case like this, you know, we have a specific flap that we do. You've got to dissect all the way to the inferior border and make releasing incisions, so you have at least a centimeter of blood supply or you'll necrose that margin. You've got to do the same thing on the lingual. But with our imaging, we know exactly where that nerve is so we can do a depth guided surgery because not only do we set up that depth guided surgery so that we don't encroach on the nerve but we also maintain the restorative space you know so it's designed by a go-to meeting together with the prosthodontist that's working with us because we have to be respectful of their restorative space facial lingual or mesial lingual uh, situation. So here, this surgery is not only depth guided, but it's also a tent pole surgery where these implants are set so they're compatible with the crestal bone in the adjacent area. Then a key is we're going to put a porous type of membrane, something that does not exclude tissue, can be titanium, plastic, or whatever, but we're going to screw it into place. Mobile, mobile membranes don't work. And then what we can do is we can come along with a, a growth factor base type of graft. Here we're using an, an infused graft, mixing that together with some re, with remodeling uh, cancellous uh, particulate like the, like the mineros that we use here. And then we also screw to the facial and say, well, that's a big lump of bone we did there. How are you going to close it? Well, if you dissect to the inferior border of the mandible, that's a passive closure. Look at the ridge height, mattress suture and oversone. Sure, she's a little bit swollen a week after surgery. You know, it always looks a little rough for about a week, but come back and there she is at one month. Look at the form and the shape of that ridge. It's totally intact, it's pink, and there we are at four months. You know, we can come in and we look at complete regeneration of the bone around that implant. And it's, there's no particles, there's no, uh, you know, non-viable material in there. It's 100% bone. We can, can uncover the implants, check stability, and go on and make for a very aesthetic restoration that's functional and will hold up. Um, George has got some other tactics and there. These are, and these are some other applications for kind of, you know, guided bone regeneration, thinking outside the box as well. A patient who comes in with severe defect in the lower anterior, wouldn't it be nice to have that mesh made before the surgery even occurred? 
Why not? We've got the virtual software to be able to reconstruct that defect exactly how we want to do it. So in this case, we'll extract the teeth. We'll put some virtual teeth in there. There's my defect. And I'm going to go ahead using some of the materialized software. I'll reconstruct that defect three-dimensionally and look at it exactly how I want to. This is exactly what the outcome is. This is what I want to have developed. And from, uh, from that, working with companies like KLS Martin, they can actually design meshes um, to be made before the surgery even occurs. Now, I got to tell you, I was really excited. I happened to meet these people through, through Dr. Spagnoli, and uh, I had planned this case out. I had worked with them in Germany, and uh, they, they were all ready to push the button and have this case um, you know, modified for me and ready to go until they told me that that was the cost, $6,000. I'm in private practice. I can't charge my patient $6,000 from a material fee just to have this cool guide made from uh, this mesh made from Germany. So what did I do? I had a model made. I simply had a medical model made of the reconstructed anatomy and I spent time on a Saturday to basically bend the mesh accordingly, had it sterilized, ready to go at the time of surgery, it cost me $250. So um, these are some of the creative thinking opportunities that we can uh, consider outside the box. Here's the, here's the surgery, there's the defect, the patient is prepped, sedated, ready for surgery. We've gone ahead, opened up the areas, uh, degranulated, there's our defect, cortical perforations fixated on the uh, lingual aspect by the striker um, uh, in instrumentation here on the right. There's the space that we're going to maintain, BMP and uh, cancellous allograft. Uh, the mesh is fixated into position. And then I'll oftentimes take a connective tissue graft, suture that uh, to the mesh, as you can see that there. Because in the event that I have any opening, I'd like to have a vascular base that that's going to open to. And as you know uh, from some of the work of um, Gargiulo and so forth, the connective tissue is gonna, graft is going to heal initially by plasmatic circulation, so it has its own blood supply, then by vascular invasion, vascular bridging, and then at 21 days, the connective tissue is well organized. And that's how it closes up. So, um, to extend that concept a little bit, is that this is another situation, you know, picture elegant 50-year-old female who bites the steering wheel. And she loses quite a bit of bone and dental structure, and along the line she had a couple of surgeries to work on this. Um, so, when we take on a case like this, we have a vertical deficiency. We can't completely correct that because we can never grow bone past uh, the, the roots of adjacent teeth. It just won't stay. But we certainly have a tremendous uh, uh, width deficiency. So here we can emulate in our uh, materially software exactly what type of uh, shape and form we'd like to get. And then we can look uh, with our software of where would the implants have to be to, to properly treat this. And what we can see is the implants basically wouldn't be in bone if they were properly placed. Um, so from there, we can use uh, bone modules to simulate what type of shape would be required, what type of enhancement would be required to properly uh, allow us to place those implants. But anyways, we can design specific meshes that fit the, fit the defect uh, we can make lab quality temporaries that of course are very, very long, but that patient's going to use this throughout this, the treatment sequence. We can cut those down on the day of surgery based upon our augmentation. We can enhance a, a site that's multiply operated with stem cells because now minimally invasive, we can pull stem cells right, right in your office. We can spin those down and concentrate them as inkable stem cells. And we can do specific types of flaps. The most dangerous thing we do in a, a maxillary reconstruction is make an incision on the crest. It's, it's scar tissue. It's not vascular. That's why it likes to break down whenever you operate on it. But we can learn from our cleft palate surgeries where if we make sulcular incisions, which we know have a dual blood supply, both the PDL and the edges of the flap, we can dissect all the way under the palate from both sides so the entire palate becomes an advancement flap based upon the greater palatine and incisive vessels. We never make an incision on the crest. Then we'll come here and make an incision above the mucogingival line. You can see the nose here, and we'll just connect the dots. Well, it's a no-risk incision. We can put in our pre-designed mesh, place our bone graft, which is uh, BMP together with stem cells, under there, screw it in place, and look at the bone we grow. 
we completely create the shape that we had in mind. So it's very specific. If we can see the problem, we can use imaging software, which is very sophisticated today, to help visualize it. We can do this by go-to meeting, so our restorative dentist or prosthodontist is sitting here, the surgeon's sitting here, the radiologist is there, but we can communicate on behalf of our patient. And that's how we do sophisticated restorations, and we can end up giving a patient a very nice, nice result. Now, we have other alternative me mechanisms of treating people. You know, certainly the, the use of things like zygoma implants are fine, and, and, and they're supposed to be used with four anterior implants or, or two minimal. You know, this is a case I did a long time ago. It's a freehand case, but it was well worked up with, with, the, with the platform. And as you can see, you know, for a freehand case, not bad, but look at the deficiency here. Sure, she is happy as can be with her result, but I'm not. Why? Because look at what I've got prosthetically. I have buccal cantilevers, and I have facial cantilevers. And I think most of our prosthodontists in the room will say, what is one of the biggest challenges with regards to material sci science, the modulus of elasticity of restorative materials? Well, the further we cantilever them, the more at risk they are for, for prosthetic problems. You know, most of the cant cantilevers in dentistry traditionally were were, were posterior, but now we're cantilevering to the anterior, but it's a whole different set of bite forces. So we need to be cognizant of this. So, so maybe instead of, of, of going that route, or, or maybe this route here, where we have a true titanium deficiency, okay, maybe what we need to do is get back to reconstructing faces. So we can reconstruct the face very, very easily in today's day and age. We can use our software, and we can say, this, this lady has no maxilla left. That's the, that's the nose, that's the anterior nasal spine. There is no alveolus remaining. We can use our software to do what we call a diagnostic denture. Our prosthodontists and general dentists know the, the form of the face, the vertical dimension, the support for the commissures, you know, the smile line, the lip line, and the speech requirements. We can emulate that in our software so we know we have to move the face this far forward and this far down to create the, 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 right, the right base. So here's a Lafort 1 osteotomy, base of the nose. This is the perfect interpositional bone graft. Minimally invasive procurement of bone through a tiny little incision. We can put that bone together with BMP, completely graft the maxilla. It's an easy closure. Yep, there she is a week afterwards, a little bit bruised, but she's not having any pain. Those are the stitches about ready to fall out, but look at the amount of bone that you can, you, that you can recreate. Very easy to do. So now, you know, four months post-op, bone's not mature, but things are looking pretty good. We'll start planning. Look at the ridge that we regrew. Is there anybody in the room that can't put an implant in there? No. Everybody can do it now. Implants are easy when you have the right bone. Isn't that right, everybody? So look, look at the quality and the quantity of bone that we have. Now we can go back to our software. We can do a precise emulation of what we want for the mini hybrid that they chose to do, somewhat for cost purposes. All the, everything's set up. So look, here's the bone on the day we grafted it. Look at the bone plates here. There's the same plates. That's all cortical bone. It's complete regeneration, but not just to the ridge, the paranasal support, the facial support, she's, she, she'll look younger. Typical sequence for placing implants, you all know how to do that better than I do. And, um, but look, here's her face when we start, and look at, the, look at the ALR bases, the tip support, the vertical dimension. You know, we can reconstruct faces today very easily in dentistry. You know, another situation, by the way, this is an epidemic. Be ready, everybody out there in dentistry. We have an epidemic of patients getting to that 60-ish age group who've been wearing dentures for 20 years. And, but yet, they're gonna live another 30 years. What are they gonna do? They wanna be happy. They wanna eat, they wanna speak, they wanna have confidence. We need to be prepared for this epidemic. This is all the bone the patient has. She has some implants that actually have fistulas around them. I elected to keep them for the short term. We can get, use our software to say we need to move the face this far to create our, cre create our effect. This is the diagnostic denture. Our prosthodontist has said, you know, proper speech, proper gutters, right to size and shape. Well, that's what the, the diagnostic denture looks like. It's huge. This is the treatment denture. Basically, you take this flange off. It's the same teeth, but it's tiny. All it does is in the operating room, we put the diagnostic denture in the patient's mouth. We put a glabellar pin in, which you can see right here. We measure to the edge of the diagnostic denture, and then we know the vertical dimension that the prosthodontist wants. 
We then put in the treatment denture, we screw it in, we cut a Lefort 1 osteotomy, down fracture it, set the occlusion, and measure the vertical dimension. When it's right, we place the bone plates. Very simple to do, okay? Take a little bit of bone. Oh, it's not all that bad. You know, I, I want to tell you something. An MOD is much harder to cut than that, all right? So, seriously. So, you know, here's our bone graph. Look at the bone we put in here. So we start with this, but look what we get. You know, we're reconstructing faces, and, and you can see how we regenerate in proper uh, AP relationships and vertical relationships. We can go back through our planning phases. You all know how to do this. You know, we've got our scanning appliances, and we've got our, our actual guides are ready to go. We've placed the implants, and what's really interesting, if you go back a slide, if you look at the far left implant, it was placed lateral to the existing implants because of the transverse dimension, whereas this one was transverse okay. So if we look at the far left one, see how each one of these implants is completely housed in newly regenerated bone at the proper. But look how much bone is facial to these implants. How much bone do you like facial to your maxillary implant? You know, Mike, two millimeters or more, right? Quote, Dr. Picos wrote that, right, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyways, you know, uh, we, we, we can do these things to regenerate the face and take these same principles to different dimensions. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about guided surgery. Um, by the way, Dan's mucogingival treatment looks fantastic as well. <laughs> it's really good. So here's, here's some guided surgery. So the question is, you know, are you going to use a bone supported guide, maybe a mucosal supported guide? Uh, two supported guide like you see here. Are we going to have rotational timing or not? Are we going to have stabilization screws into the bone? Uh, how are we going to do this case? And th the real question for me is are we accurate? Are we, are we really accurate with all this technology that we have today? So let's look at a couple syst systematic reviews to find this question out. In fact, uh, this is one of Jeff Canales' papers. And basically what they found with this meta-analysis is that our entry point deviations are sub-millimeter. Pretty good. Apical point deviations, maybe 0.85, but look at the, look at the, look at the maximum discrepancy, 7.1 millimeters. When we look at some of the, the work from this group at Clinical Oral Implants Research, you know, basically the implants had a high survival rate, but the mean entry point deviation is a millimeter or so, and the apical point deviation was 1.63. The conclusion was also a lot of these implants have a technique related issues at the time of surgery. A number of perioperative uh, complications are, are, are observed. So what does this mean? This means garbage in, garbage out. If it ain't right with the plan, it's not going to carry over and be right at the time of surgery. So one of the things that I happen to have a, an opportunity to be involved in was a study with Tiziano Testori, who I know is on this uh, program. He's uh, one of the most talented uh, oral surgeon periodontists that I know of Italy, and you're very lucky to, to hear him. But basically what we did is we wanted to evaluate the accuracy and precision of the Biomet Navigator, uh, a guided system with materialized through uh, Biomet 3i. We treated 25 patients at eight centers uh, in the U.S. and in, uh, well, we were the only center in the U.S., but also in, in Europe. We placed 170 17 implants as a team, and then we evaluated the, the, uh, the implants post-operatively. So pre-operative scan and implant planning, post-operative um, uh, scans, and then the two were, were, were basically matched and they were interfaced to evaluate for discrepancies. And basically what we found is that our entry point deviations were pretty consistent with the literature, 1.32. Our apical points were also about the same, uh, 1.5. Our angle deviations were 3.26 millimeters. The posterior implants had a higher frequency of being wrong than the anterior implants, and our actual outcomes using these guides were more precise when we used tooth, uh, when we used um, a bone or mucosal supported appliances than using tooth supported uh, guides, which was interesting. The most interesting thing that Tiziano did, and I think this kind of speaks to his genius, is that he basically did something called a center of mass evaluation. So he basically looked at um, where all the implants were and where they ended up and looked at kind of some of the, the, you know, the differences. And what I think was striking is that in only one of our cases, just one, were the implants actually consistent, coincident, pre and post. You know, and you've got a number of guys here that have been involved with guided surgery from the very beginning. A lot of talented people who, you know, have given a lot of their life to this, uh, this area of dentistry. And only one case where we, our actual outcome was exactly what the plan is, that tells me that, you know, we're not exactly as accurate and precise as we may want to think 
we are. The conclusions with the study was that there's a two millimeter safety zone that should be considered and then we should be considering immediate load cases with provisionalization, never go into final restorations. So the slide on the left shows you uh, our um, numbers and then uh, the bottom is the uh, values in the literature. And so the question I have is really, you know, who's planning the case? Who's doing the case? Who is our pilot for these types of guided surgery? Because again, garbage in, garbage out. So if you're George Jetson taking a Saturday evening stroll with the family, this is kind of how you're doing your planning, you're going to end up with a more significant uh, discrepancy. If you're Maverick flying the uh, stealth bomber, probably going to be a little more accurate. And if you really don't know where you're going like an airplane, we may have problems. Because it really all comes down to um, uh, flight geometry and these concepts of yaw, pitch, and roll, which are you know, pretty well known in the orthodontic and ortho orthonathic uh, literature. But it's basically the XYZ axis. And essentially what we ended up finding was when we looked at the center of mass, it's all about the guide. The guide is very, very rarely in the right position as it was planned, as it was developed. And until we get to a point in our, um, in our, in our discipline where we end up having fiduciary markers that can be put into the guide, seated on the patient, the patient image, and that positional um, uh, that XYZ coordinate of the guide basically be validated and verified into where the guide was positioned. When, until those are coincident before the surgery occurs, we're really never going to be 100% accurate, nor can we be 100% confident that the guide is exactly where, it's, uh, where it was supposed to be and how it was developed. And again, this is the center of mass um, outcome, and you can see where the planning was in green and where our, our actual outcomes were in red. So let me uh, introduce you to my world. I don't move a lot of faces and so forth, but I do deal with a lot of significant uh, malocclusions. This is a patient who has a posterior malocclusion. Her lower anterior teeth are retroclined. She needs orthodontic therapy. And she also has three implant failures in tooth number 10. You know, she's a young mom of two. Um, she values dentistry. She values what we can do. And she wants a dental implant there. She doesn't want her natural teeth cut down for a bridge. Pretty challenging situation. And when you look at the uh, defects that have been left uh, as a result of her failures, we've got a significant dental alveolar uh, bone discrepancy here. Radiographically, from a cone beam standpoint, doesn't tell us the full tale. Uh, it looks like there may be some bone there, but in reality, there isn't. So in Amy's case, what we're going to do, a fairly significant surgery, we're going to go ahead and get her bracketed up for surgically facilitated orthodontic therapy. The flap exposure, as you see here, and you can see that defect pretty ominous at tooth number 10. But also keep your eye on tooth number 11 because that's a pretty significant amount of bone or insignificant amount of bone around that tooth. That's very, very thin. And as orthodontic starts to move that tooth around, you know what's going to happen to that bone. So what we're going to elect to do is corticotomies and dental alveolar decortication on the upper and lower arches. We're going to go ahead and create a titanium uh, mesh with a tenting screw, as you can see there. Uh, this is Mineros uh, for a particular bone grafting to change the outer orthodontic walls. We're essentially, as Dan was saying, going to change the most plastic structure in the, in the arch. We're going to change the dental alveolar bone and we're going to put the teeth to fit where it, they need to be from an intermaxillary position, from an occlusal position, from an aesthetic position, from an airway position, and most importantly, as a contingency plan. Because as this patient ages, if she ever needs any dentistry done in the future, the teeth are going to be in the right position for the most aesthetic and natural outcome. This is BMP2 and a cancellous allograft there uh, to reconstruct the defect at tooth number 10. You know, and if I had done this a little differently today, I would have done a much more significant flap on the palate and uh, extended the mesh to tack it down on the palate. Because what I ended up doing was actually having the mesh be, mesh be a little bit too um, limited on the palatal aspect, and I had to come through the buckle with the suture, through the mesh, and back through the palate, and basically cinch this down. So it was a little, uh, probably didn't have as much graft material as I wanted uh, on, uh, on the palatal aspect. And you know, there's a recent article that just came out at, um, uh, through the University of Louisville in their graduate periodontal program where I uh, went to school. And they basically showed that when you're grafting for ridges from a horizontal perspective, you know, you're going to lose about 30 to 35 percent of the bone that you put in there. So you only really have to significantly overcorrect for the anticipated loss that's going to occur. 
So when we see Amy roughly about a year later, the orthodontics are just about done now. It looks like we have a pretty good outcome, but the question is, you know, really how good is that bone density? Do I want to do this case flapless, knowing what I've, you know, been involved in terms of, you know, Tiziano's work, that I'm going to be off perhaps three millimeters in, or a millimeter or so in an entry point and perhaps three um, uh, degrees from an angle discrepancy standpoint? I want to be able to see that bone and make sure that I can make any corrections if I need to. But the stakes are getting higher. You know, I've had a significant reconstruction here. I put this patient through a lot of surgery. She's had her teeth moved. Everything is looking good. I need to make sure that I do right by her and that I make sure that the implant is in the best position possible and I take the right steps to make sure that I have good primary stability. So flapless surgery, well, it's a nice opportunity, but not in, not in this case, not in my hands. So here's the original defect. You can see the outcome. It's pretty impressive from a uh, from a bone perspective in terms of being able to regenerate bone that you know had a significant deficiency at the number 10 position but what's more important to me as a periodontist is what I've done for those other natural teeth I have totally changed the facial bone skeleton around those teeth and I have improved their health long term and that's evident certainly by looking at the cusp and the central incisors the beautiful thing about this bone also is you'll notice that it's bleeding okay this isn't dead bone you can't even see where there is a graft this looks like it's totally incorporated natural bone. So at that, the guide's going to go into place, the implant is placed, but ah, I have a problem. I have a problem, and I have a problem right here. Because that guide's not seated. And though it may feel seated, and I can't push it, and I can't uh, get it to engage any further, it's as good as it's going to get. It's not in intimate contact with that central incisor. And so back to the center of mass, the guide is the problem. And validation and verification is not here today in guided surgery, and that's to an extent why we have some of the discrepancies that we have. So, um, we can take that concept of full facial surgery. You know, many of you, uh, as surgeons, uh, orthodontists, um, prosthodontists, and general dentists, uh, are probably working with some teams uh, where now they're doing all of their orthognathic surgery prep virtually. You know, it used to be three, four hours of model surgery sitting in there at night. And now we basically just do everything virtually. Now with our, uh, the next step for us is the intraoral scanners so that we just generate STL files. Right now we'll take impressions of our models, pour them in dye stones so they're very dense, and we'll incorporate that as an STL file into our cone beam, into our CT. But hopefully we can skip that for a uh, very soon. So virtual surgery has a, has a lot of advantages. First, firstly, we see it better. Remember, I keep saying what we see we can fix so we can ac accurately position the maxilla and the mandible. If there's an asymmetry, while we're doing the, uh, the virtual prep, we can turn the skull over and look at the skull base, and you can always see asymmetries in the skull base. So you can say, does this make sense, and then I can correct it. Evaluating, you all pitch and roll. We can really take a look at that, as George mentioned earlier. And we can adjust for that natural head position so that we're actually, if somebody holds their head in a tilted position, we can, we can correct for that. Uh, see anatomic relationships. We can study where the nerve is, if it's a low nerve, a high nerve, a, a lingual nerve, a, a, a facial nerve position, so we can increase safety in our osteotomies, and then we can follow the path. Um, you know, when I was still in Charlotte, my group, Myron Tucker, Brian Farrell, myself, you know, we collaborated together and, and, and really enhanced uh, what Jamie Catano in Houston really started this whole process. Um, um, but we felt it was a little bit cumbersome, so we just took everything that was outside with goniometers and things that were going through the lips, and we brought them all inside, so that makes it much easier. And that's uh, uh, actually published by Brian Farrell. So to show you how easy this is, in a preoperative appointment, we want to do that at least two weeks beforehand. We're going to take two impressions of the maxilla and two of the lower form and die stone. We're going to get a bite registration with a fiduciary, uh, get the natural head position, take the cone beam, give instructions, and um, we'll get all the parts together. So these are the parts. This is the fiduciary. It goes up in the palate between two layers of, of, of uh, pink wax that you use to make your bite with. This is a laser level. You can get over at the uh, hardware store and you can put it here. And these are fiduciary stickers you can put on the face. You know, basically just a blown up view of them. So in, in your um, diagnostic room, you can project the laser level like the construction guy does on the face. And you can adjust the face for symmetry, uh, the stare to the, to the um, horizon, 
And now with those fiduciaries on the face, you can scan the patient. You also have a fiduciary in the mouth. So when you scan the patient, you can see we lined the patient up in the scanner exactly the way they were lined up when we took the photographs. So we, when we put this patient into our software, we're emulating the same position. Then either with your lab scanner or your, um, your uh, cone beam scanner, you can scan the models and you can also scan the final occlusion that you hope to achieve. All of that is sent to medical modeling uh, to use the SimPlan software to do the virtual planning. We don't have to do model surgery. It's completely eliminated. This is a session. This is sitting in my office. There's a, a biomedical engineer sitting at a workstation, and maybe the orthodontist sitting in their office. We don't have to drive across town. So we can sit there and, and, and plan the entire case uh, to meet all of our requirements. Uh, how we're going to move the maxillo, how we're going to move the mandible, every measurement, where the nerves are, and we, we have a flow sheet for every case. Then in addition to that, they generate the splints for us. So if it's a two-jaw surgery, you know, you use one splint to perhaps reposition the mandible. You take that one out, then you cut the maxilla, second splint to reposition the maxilla, everything's rigid fixated and everybody goes home happy. Um, you know, a few things about splits to make it go better. So let's just look at an application. Here we have, a, have a, a, a very beautiful young girl. She's got a little bit of uh, asymmetry. She has some maxillary deficiency. You can see a class three malocclusion with a little bit of a crossbite tendency. We can use programs like Dolphin uh, to do a two-dimensional simulation of what that profile is going to look like when we, when we complete the surgery. And then at the pre-op visit, we get our records, standard photography, we get the cone beam CT with the fiduciaries on it, all of the other parts of the workup we talked about. Um, nowadays, it can just be scanned. You don't have to set the models. Then we get on the workstation. We can emulate the change in three dimensions. You know, what we see, we understand. Um, after that, we get a, a, a worksheet tells us step by step what we're going to do in the surgery. At this point, the surgeon is just a mechanic. Like I said, surgery is not all that hard. In fact, the easiest thing I do is surgery. It's the planning. It's getting it right. It's coordinating with my orthodontist, coordinating with my prosthodontist, you know, coordinating with my anesthesiologist. It's all the planning that makes surgery go well. Cutting an osteotomy is not that hard. But at the end of the day, you see, we can take this young lady and you know, help her life and give her a good functional occlusion. And we can do it all by planning. Um, and, at the, and, and then you can see the fixation, and we can come back afterwards, like, like George mentioned, validation. Well, we can make sure condyles are seated, proper uh, occlusal relationships, proper relations of the osteotomies, good rigid fixation. We can validate our plan. We can make sure we, we did what we planned to do. Um, unfortunately, there's some individuals who, who suffer terrible temporomandibular joint disease, some of which, like this lady, will need to have a joint replaced. You can see, I know all the, the eyes out there are seeing the open bite on the right side, and it's closed on the left, and uh, we're missing a condyle over here due to trauma. But again, you see, she wasn't ankylosed, so we could take impressions. There's the, skin, there's the, the teeth from the dental model, interpret you know interpolated into the CT scan so we get you know dental anatomy in a CAT scan it makes it much more accurate from there we can go through the whole stage where we're going to replace this joint but we have to do a sagittal split on this side to, to take care of this asymmetry so we can plan step by step by virtual surgical planning knowing what the nerve is the design of the joint all of this before we ever get to the operating room even the splints to set the the bite are, are created ahead of time, uh, so there's no guesswork. We get to the operating room, even the lengths of the screws that we place, we know. That makes surgery faster, more accurate, more predictable. Giving good outcomes to the patient is what it really matters. And of course, here we have the, 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 the condyl and fossa, and of course, the, the shaft of, of the joint replacement. And afterwards, we can come back and validate. Sagittal split, exactly where we expected it joint replacement, exactly where we expected it. Here you see the condyle nicely seated in the faucet. Now the space you see there, by the way, is the plastic of the, uh, of the joint replacement. The, 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 this particular joint is designed with a little bit of a vertical offset so that the rotation 
uh, stays similar, and that's just an engineering principle. So we can, we can do it with great specificity. It gets diff more difficult. This is a multiply operated patient with a full cranial base ankylosis. You know, most of you remember that frame and spinosum is about right there next to the spine of the, the, the sphenoid. You know, that's the, the blood supply to the, uh, where the middle meningeal artery goes through. Uh, this is a very vascular area. Of course, we have branches of the maxillary artery, the carotid artery, and the retromandibular vein. So now we can diagnose these cases and, and we can make what are called cutting guides. The cutting guides slip onto the patient and we cut through the guide so that we know that we are not going to uh, injure a vital structure. Uh, let's see here. Go back for a second. Yeah, so, so basically uh, all the joints based upon this gap arthroplasty are designed ahead of time to the specific occlusion with splints made. You can see complete ankylosis. There's no sign of a joint left there. And we get to the operating room. We have all of this information to look at. Here we're using surgical navigation. So now we can take, put fiduciaries onto the patient, link that to the CAT scan, and when we cut with this saw, we're able to see where we're cutting on the CAT scan while we cut. So especially in these very vital areas, it brings efficiency and accuracy and most importantly, safety to the surgery so we don't have uh, unnecessary damage to, uh, to the tissues. You know, as, as most of us have imaging in our office, you know, our responsibility has increased dramatically. How many of us are really embracing the oral maxillofacial radiologist, a specialty that just got recognized uh, by the ADA and certainly needs to be empowered and embraced by all of us as a treating team member, just like uh, Dan and I would to the restorative uh, uh, our, our counterparts. You know, if you had any of these uh, scans taken in your office, you're responsible. Well, let's take a look at this. Are you really comfortable in reading what this is? Are you really comfortable in managing this patient? Because this is multiple myeloma here. This is a chondrosarcoma in the posterior one-third of the tongue. This is fibrous dysplasia of the skull base. And this is a large cell lymphoma. These are patients that are coming into your office and we have a greater responsibility to do right by them and to have all the imaging information um, evaluated thoroughly. That's why we're doctors. We're not technicians. We're not responsible for just what we know. We're responsible for that patient. At least that's my perspective. From a dental standpoint, you know, there's two aspects that I also really kind of hone into, and that's the dental alveolar bone, as you see here, and then the alveoloskeletal component. This article was written by Rick Robley, and of course, he talks about the orthodontic walls, um, a paper that was written by Chet Handelman, an orthodontist in the Chicagoland area where I'm at, and essentially, he talks about the teeth needing to be moved within bone. But what about these teeth? What if you were to move these teeth? There's a palatal wall right there. There's a tooth in the middle that basically has already undergone resorption. What's the risk of more resorption if you start moving that tooth? And the, the uh, tooth over to the right, I mean, if you're going to do some lingual tipping, what's the potential for that um, apex to resorb? And having that information ahead of time, I think, is dramatically, is, is, you know, quite important. What about this? Is this perhaps tooth being moved outside the orthodontic envelope? <laughs> perhaps. But today we have opportunities to change the skeleton. And that's what Dan and I are really excited about, is we can change the skeleton and move things to it. We can graft bone where it never was before. And we can redefine the orthodontic walls. No longer does the orthodontist have to deal with extraction of teeth and moving the teeth within the trough. Particularly with airway issues today and enlarged tongue and low hyoid bones, we want to expand the arches. We do not want to be taking out teeth if we can avoid it. And so we're going to change the orthodontic walls, as you see here, uh, same patient, different axial views, but we're basically going to change the orthodontic walls through uh, facilitated orthodontic therapy. So one of the great things for me with imaging is I'm able to now understand the facial bone and the risks associated with interdisciplinary treatment and the limitations of facial bone. And we look at it from a crestal perspective and a radicular perspective. Crestal perspective being from the crest to four millimeters and then the uh, radicular portion being the rest of it. And this is a kind of a landmark paper for me by Danny Boozer's group looking at 500 patients and uh, all of them having imaging and evaluating from premolar to premolar and then measuring, you know, what's the facial bone at the crest and then at the mid root position. And they called those two positions MP1 and MP2 and they measure the thickness at both of those areas. And there's no surprise here. We don't have any facial bone. In 90% of the patients evaluated, the facial bone thickness was less than one millimeter. That's very vulnerable. I mean, from a periodontal perspective, um, that is significant. 
And it keeps getting worse. The papers that keep coming out in our literature and others, you know, just keep telling the same old story. So the question is, you know, we're not losing teeth because we don't have facial bones, so what's the significance? Well, there isn't a lot of significance unless, unless you intervene. Unless you're intervening orthodontically, you have a consequence. Unless you're intervening orthodontically, you have a consequence, and certainly restoratively and, of course, surgically. So restoratively, orthodontically, and surgically, we've got consequences if we're going to start to deal with anatomy where we have limitations. And so our group um, in Chicago came up with a classification that I'd like to share with you. Um, one of the interesting things about working with uh, somebody like, uh, like Dan um, is that he's taught me a lot about facial growth. You know, and I spent four years at the University of Michigan and I don't even remember who Don Enloe was. <laughs> and that's kind of a travesty. But basically, facial growth and, these, and their concepts are critically important to me as a periodontist who hasn't even thought about these things since perhaps my first or second year of dental school. And you know, the face grows from the sphenoocipital synchondrosis, right? And it's growing out. And at age seven, you know, I've got, I've got two girls. One just turned four and one, uh, one is seven years old. And dad can't do anything about facial bone in my daughters. Once they hit seven, that's it. That's all there is. At age seven, you will never have any more facial bone than at that point in your life. And in fact, it's all downhill after that. When, they, when we're in our growth phase, we have these areas of depository and resorptive fields. And you can see the resorptive fields here in red. But after growth, there's a slow resorptive effect that's going to occur throughout the patient's lifetime. And we know the craniofacial growth with height and, and depth, you know, and there's really remodeling that occurs um, as a result of injury and so forth that occurs later in life. But as growth occurs, the process is really modeling. Facial musculatures are going to exert a continuous force for the rest of our lives. So as a periodontist, when I'm evaluating a patient, can I move these teeth orthodontically? What's the risk and so forth? Well, you've got a good attached gingiva. Sure, go ahead and move the teeth. And then five, ten years later, restorative goes on, and now there's re recession around all the teeth. Well, what's happening here? Looks like you have a nice crustal band of attached gingiva because that's old school thinking. That's, that's classical thinking, and we need to be more progressive, and imaging allows us to do that. And when you look at the cross-sectional view of these teeth, perhaps there's you know, decent crustal bone, but at the midroot position, there isn't any. And so when you dissect these cases, you can understand the insertion of the mentalis muscle and the force and the pressure that that mentalis muscle is putting on that midroot position long term. And what does that result in? It results in this. Crustal bone, but no radicular bone. Increased risk, particularly with the braces that you see. You know, as periodontists, we taught ourselves as being the experts at the dental gingival complex and being able to kind of put the biologic width exactly where it needs to be. And we've got wonderful people who have published a lot on that. And there's even data in the literature now to, to support, you know, you don't necessarily need to bound, bone sound patients. You can look at it from an imaging standpoint and see if there's an altered active situation going on here. And when you have thick bone, you're usually going to have the tissue in the wrong position. And so through um, imaging information, ha taking that uh, information and applying it to an aesthetic crown enhancement perspective, I can take a patient like this who's my dental assistant, my surgical assistant, who has an altered active situation and no biologic width position that's been uh, naturally created, and I can change that counter for her, and I can improve her smile. What about Miguel? Miguel's a patient who has orthodontics, and he's a significant alveoloskeletal case, and he is a patient who needs orthodontic surgery, doesn't want to have orthodontic surgery. And so he's got significant risk. It's more important for me to save these teeth for him, because if he loses his teeth, is he going to be an implant candidate? Not unless he loses 20 millimeters of vertical bone height. Pretty significant. And there's even articles coming out today in the orthodontic literature. You know, when you do surgically assisted rapid palatal expansion surgeries, and I like to kind of tease Dan a little bit about this because I'm trying to flip the script on the program that he's the chairman of to think a little bit differently and to think more periodontally what's going on at the periodontium level. You know, this was a study that was done that looked at 25 young adults. You know, they did orthodontic surgically assisted rapid palatal expansion cone beams a year later, and then they basically um, found that they had lost no attachment. Tissue's in a good position. Well, all the orthodontic cases are because they're basically um, young people. You know, they, they, they have, they've increased risk now, but they basically have no attachment loss. What this paper showed in the second cone beam that was done was that you thin the buccal alveolar bone by 55% with some of these procedures. Now, I've just been up here talking to you for the last half hour about the fact that we don't have any facial bone. 
And now we're going to do procedures like orthodontics and uh, SR, uh, SARPs and so forth and thin it even more and make these patients more periodontal annuities. There's opportunities to do to change the game, to change the way we look at things. So today what Dan and I will oftentimes do is we'll do corticotomies on a patient like this who has significant problems, dental alveolar bone grafting, sometimes soft tissue grafting at the same time, and we'll change that patient's risk. And we go from here that you see on the initial to there on the one-year reentry. And uh, the orthodontist couldn't quite correct the, uh, the crossbite, but I had a chance to re-enter that area. And that's where we started, and that's the periodontal regeneration that we're capable of doing today. And our profession is getting better and better at achieving even better outcomes, um, and that's our future. And we could take a pre-op PA like this and go to something like that in one year, in a predictable level. It's not an insignificant surgery. It's detailed planning, but it's definitely capable and it's possible. And this is his lower arch. And I probably should have done a little bit more grafting. You can see the lingual there, pretty significant. And we could take Miguel and go from here to there, a non-extraction case, manage him in a little different um, uh, environment, and improve the overall uh, occlusion, improve his smile, and improve the periodontal outcome. So it would be my contest that this would be the area here on the lower arch to now do the orthognathic surgery on him once the periodontium was reconstructed and improved. And you can see the before and after CBCTs here um, and uh, the changes in the dental alveolar bone. So we've come up with a classification system and basically we look at the crest and the midroot position. If it's greater than a millimeter at both uh, areas, it's a thick, thick phenotype and that's what the underlying skeleton would look like. If it's thin at the uh, crest, it would be a thin thick, and this would be the clinical situation, and this would essentially be the anatomic phenotype. A thick thin is really our snake pit, because our thick thin is a patient who has a thick crestal bone and is misleading, because now once we start to move those teeth, you turn that patient into a thin thin and an annuity for periodontal and significant problems long term, because that's what's going to end up happening. So today, and this is the paper in International Journal, you know, again, it's my classical training, you know, what are, we, what are we trained to think about? We're trained to think about, well, there's periosteum as we're moving teeth around. And you can move the teeth out of the bone and move it back in, and the dehiscences will, you know, uh, will be um, recovered. Okay, and this was a classic article in the 80s that showed that. You take teeth out of bone, and they don't lose attachment, but the orientation of the connective tissue fibers change dramatically, and there's no bone along the teeth any longer. And this is basically what we do all day long. And this is exactly what uh, some of my colleagues continue to do. And you can see these teeth just basically extending right out and losing bone, just like the paper showed. So today with reconstructive surgery, we'll basically not only graft for implant site development and do a nasal palatine nerectomy and uh, corticotomies, but we'll also reconstruct the alveolus around the natural teeth to improve the outcome for this patient long term. And here we go, the same situation. This is a thick, thin phenotype. We're going to go ahead and do uh, corticotomies. Now I made a mistake in this case because there's no way I should have gone all the way up to the interproximal bone. I should have stopped two, three millimeters shy of that. And because of that, I lost a little bit of the interproximal bone. But we did a reentry, and you can see the outcome. And the most impressive part of the outcome is that, the thick facial bone that will maintain long term and will turn over over, uh, over this patient's lifetime. This is a robust uh, allograft that was used. And in fact, I took a core biopsy to understand exactly what I was able to gain, 51% new vital bone formation. So what's happening at the root surface? We don't 100% know, but we do have data that we can extrapolate from. Some of Mike McGuire's work in Houston, Texas, who showed that from a recession-based model using growth factor-mediated approaches of, connect of uh, root coverage, we can achieve uh, new uh, cementum, periodontal ligament, um, inserting connective tissue fibers and, and bone. Dan talked a little bit about an epidemic. One of the epidemics that we're going to have in this country is airway, obstructive sleep disorder breathing. And we are in a perfect position to identify these patients and have these uh, problems managed from these patients long term. You know, we, typically we only saw these patients from a lateral CEF standpoint. We couldn't see it three-dimensionally. Now we can see the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, the hypopharynx, and all these conditions. Yeah, just go back for a second. So when we look at the airway, now with the software that we have, we're able to do volumetric assessment of the airway and actually look at the point of maximum constriction. And then we can correlate that to two-dimensional data. And, and that's really important as we try to, to diagnose the patient to determine how do we change the facial skeleton to improve their airway, or are they a patient that can be treated by more conservative means, a dental repositioning device, which can be quite effective, or CPAP. But the moderate to severe uh, obstructive sleep apnea patient may need a maxillary mandibular advancement. And, and one of the things, how do you get this thing to work? Click. 
Oh yeah. So one of the things that this also does is we start to think in three dimensions instead of two. This is a preoperative airway. There's the cone of maximum constriction. And, and one other advantage to this type of software is it's educational. When you have a 60-year-old person come to your office and um, uh, they don't understand their problem, when you can show it to them so graphically, they understand it better. This is the post-operative airway. And if you can look at the volumetric numbers, you can see we more than doubled the posterior airway space with this maxillary mandibular advancement. This has major medical benefits to the patient. So when we see a patient we can, like this, we need to be uh, thinking about you, airway, you, you adenoids, move. tonsils, all these types of things that can contribute, as you see there, and can be picked up by imaging. Uh, even the exostosis, what does that do to the tongue posturing? Yeah, airway it. space there. You know, I'm a periodontist. I do a lot of IV sedation, but looking at the airway and such like this, I'm concerned about can I secure that if I'm doing an airway and I have, a, and I have an issue um, as a part of my treatment. Looking at a patient like Allison, she's a 13-year-old. She's got a crowded dentition. She, orthodontist wants to take out teeth. Look at the size of that tongue. That's the number one risk factor for long-term uh, risk for sleep disorder breathing. Imaging today also allows us to look at the position of the, of the hyoid bone. Is that an area that's going to become a complication long term? Maybe or, uh, taking out teeth and moving things back isn't the right idea for her. This is a, a graphic that came out of an article just showing the apneic on the, on the lower aspect, low, high, low inferior hyoid position, significant problem. So with Allison's case, we'll do the same thing. We'll create the biologic width. We'll go ahead and do our corticotomies. We'll expand her rather than take out teeth, improve her face, aesthetics, move the teeth rapidly, and set her up long term. And even in orthognathic cases, as we're doing with Dan right now, when we decompensate patients, we take them out of the dental alveolar bone. So as a paradigm shift, we're going to take this patient, we're going to change the position of the teeth, we're going to put them in bone, and we're going to set this patient up beautifully for orthognathic surgery, and I'm going to tee it up perfectly for my chairman, who's now going to take it home with orthognathic surgery. Changing the dental alveolar bone. And we're also changing A and B point significantly. We can almost change the skeleton by some of these um, surgeries as well. So we're going to finish up the morning with sort of the, the horizon and where we are today and a little bit about where dentistry can go in terms of our impact. So some of you, no matter what field you're in, may have seen a patient like this come into your office. This is a patient status post a resection of a tumor and a very frequent surgeon surgery is the use of a microvascular fibula attached to a bone plate. When we look at this, the bone plate's made to the face of the shape. Well, that means the fibula's too far lateral for the dentition. It's attached to the chin. It's too far anterior. There's no potential to have a vestibule. And of course, vertically, it's a disaster. So picture this in your mind, and how would you restore that? It's fairly challenging. It might be two or three more surgeries. It may still not work. So we said to ourselves, maybe we need to change things. So basically, we've come up with a new virtual surgical planning protocol. Uh, we call it hybridized reconstruction. And what we can do is we can look at a tumor. We can do our prosthetic-based planning, where we again scan models, put those into the CAT scan, and then we can design the fibula so it's specifically aligned to where the teeth should be at the superior border, not attached to the bone plate on the inferior border. From there, we can design a system where we have a superior border plate pre-bent to the shape of the fibula, which we have to osteitemize, because remember, it's a straight bone, and then a second plate for the facial skeleton. Everything in between the fibula here and the base plate here, we do by tissue engineering. So we take the straight bone, because it's vascularized, and we can bring soft tissue with it, and we add stem cells, growth factors, and microparticulates. Then, the precision of the surgery is, we, again, we have those cutting guides. The cutting guides index the holes for the bone plates. So when we take out the tumor, we, the plates are an exact fit, so we completely restore the facial skeleton back to its normal dimensions. In the operating room, we CAT scan the fibula as well. We know the shape of the fibula, so we have a little um, jig that goes onto the fibula. It's like a miter box. All the osteotomies to bend the fibula to the right shape are, are built into it. We can draw off stem cells from the iliac crest, spin those down, and so we have both the long bone and the tissue engineering components. 
Here we are, the fibula, the cutting guide. There's the bone plate. So the fibula is up here, the tissue engineering graph's there, and we instantly have the right shape. So look where it goes to from here. There's the fibula in the right spot, the tissue engineering graph, the upper plate, the lower plate. So here we have the skin paddle we took from the leg because all of that tissue was gone from the tumor. And of course it's too thick, but we, all we have to do is come back and do a vestibuloplasty, but look at the size of that ridge. We removed the superior plate at that point, and then after that, we took a straight bone and we turned it into a curved bone. It completely remodels and basically everything from the base of the fibula to the plate fills in with bone. We can then come back and do our, our prep for our implant placement and look what happens. Where the straight bone osteotomies were, look at the periosteal bone development. And so we're changing the bone into a curved bone. This is the fibula, this is the tissue engineering bone. So we're making a full-size bone when we never could do that before. This is what the ridge looks like like after the vestibuloplasty. Here we have a, an interim prosthesis in place. The occlusion is spot on. That, that mandible is exactly where it should be. My prosthodontist makes a scanning guide. Had simple uh, gutta percha in there. We, got, we, we, we plan the implants, we place them, and you can see the validation. The implants line up to the teeth. This patient will have fixed prosthodontics from a major continuity defect to spot on. Look at the occlusion. You know, this is his normal occlusion, normal vertical dimension. He doesn't even have to have a hybrid. It's spot on. That's how accurate we are today. Now, in some patients, for cost reasons or other reasons, the prosthodontist and the patient prefer a hybrid. So if we're going to do a hybrid, we leave a little more prosthetic space. And we can place the fibula down an extra two or three millimeters. On, on um, hybrid cases, we place the implants while the fibula is still in the leg because we can plan them that accurately. So again, here's, the, here's the, uh, the jig for the fibula. You can see where the implants are gonna go. So we can place the implants while we're still in the operating room. Here's the cutting guides to resect the fibula. We added this little uh, basal portion to make it even more stable and accurate. The design of the upper plate and the lower plate. Here we are resecting the tumor in the OR through the cutting guides, upper plate and the lower plate in position. We've stabilized to the exact position. Here we are procuring the fibula with a little bit of skin paddle, and there we are placing the dental implants while the fibula is still in the leg. We can then take that fibula, place the fibula on the superior plate, put the tissue engineering graft to graft the rest of it. This is the vascular anastomosis, where you tie the artery in the vein from the neck or from the facial artery to the uh, 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 fibular branch. And here we are, complete reconstruction. And there we are with, with the implants ready for uh, reconstruction. And, there, and here's this gentleman just a, a couple months after surgery and already has a ridge exactly in the right position for his reconstruction. Now, uh, I think I have about three minutes left. Um, you know, another type of reconstruction that sometimes will happen is this gentleman had multiple surgeries. We can use modeling in a case like this. So now we take our CAT scans and we develop a model. He lost the orbital floor, the lateral orbital rim, the zygoma, most of the maxilla. The mandible was in bad position. He wouldn't let me fix that. What we're looking at here is there's the, the lateral incisor tooth. That's all the way up to the orbit. There's no bone anywhere. But here's a reconstruction where we take a mesh, attach it to the opposite palate where there was palate. We, we use ribs to create an outer box to replace the face, and everything deep to that is our tissue engineering graft. We can t totally regenerate the skeleton. Once we do that, we can emulate the opposite zygoma and create a new zygoma in cheek uh, out of a material called peak, and we can screw that in place. This is just a bicoronal flap. You can see the temporalis muscle was missing. It was gone from other surgeries, so we also had to graft that area to create the uh, the, the look of a temporalis muscle. But here, when you come back, you can see that's the little piece of rib. Look at the width of the bone and look at the height of the bone and how we can completely regrow a ridge where there wasn't one. So we can come from nothing. We can place our implants fairly easy when you have the bone. And again, this is right after doing a, a little bit of a, of a powder graft to create a little bit of attached tissue. But you can see the shape of the ridge and a hybrid prosthesis. So in other words, this face goes from this with no teeth to somebody that can get back into society. And that's part of our goal. So again, thank you so much for having, uh, giving us the opportunity to talk yeah. to you. And